Awesome. Last week, Pastor JP gave the first in this series of four messages that we have entitled, Living a Life That Matters. He did a great job, a fine job, of teaching that last portion, that last segment of Philippians chapter 1. And he challenged us that if we want to live a life that matters, that requires us to, number one, stand strong together. Number two, be bold in Christ. And number three, and my least favorite, embrace suffering. I don't know about you, I don't like to suffer, okay? I don't think anybody does. But to embrace it and to realize, hey, this is what God has given me at this point in time. This morning, that we will be taking a step further. We'll be looking at, at the verses that Janisha just read in chapter 2. And there we're going to see that if we want to live a life that matters, it's going to require us to be others-centered. We tend to be, what, self-centered. Okay, who do I look out for? Ah, good old number one, right? That, I think that's true of virtually everyone. I tell people, the people that don't believe that, that we're sinners, that don't believe that we're born with a sin nature, you know what you call those people? Well, I don't know, but you certainly don't call them parents. Because if you're a parent, you know that your child has a sin nature. Okay? You just know it. And a child and all of us tend to want what we want when we want it. And if we want to really live a life that matters, God's word in Philippians chapter 2 says we need to learn to become others-centered, not self-centered. We've got to stop focusing on ourselves, you know, looking out for good old number one, and truly focus on what is best for other people, other people in the body of Christ, other people even outside the body of Christ. As we heard Janisha read a little bit ago, in Philippians chapter 2, Paul starts out with a theme that's really quite common in Philippians, and that's, he talks about joy, about joy. Now, he's in prison, so he's going through a hard time, the Philippian church is going through a hard time. They're going through a time of persecution. And yet, he says in the midst of this, we need to be joyful. We need to rejoice and we need to share our joy with other people. It needs to be a mutual give and take thing. He deals with that especially just after this section of text that we're looking at where he encourages the Philippians to share their joy with him just as he has shared his joy with them. It needs to be a symbiotic relationship. That's what, what God's word calls for. Now in chapter 2, Paul is just going to focus on the part where he's challenging them and actually even commanding them, hey, make my joy complete. That's his command to them. Philippian church, I want you to fill up my joy I want you to make it full to the top. Now, he talks about that at the beginning of verse 2. How can the Philippian church really do that? I mean, it's one thing to say, hey, make me happy, make me joyous. But it just doesn't automatically happen. How does that happen? Well, the second part of verse 2 and then... Uh, in the second part of verse 2, he gives basically a general overall statement about how that happens. And then he fleshes it out in verses 3 through 5 and following. So, how can the Philippians make Paul's joy full? How can, if we bring it down to today, how can we make each other's joy full? full and complete, would be a valid question to ask. And Paul answers that question here, like I say, starting in verse 2. Great, already got it up there. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Cynthia. So, the first thing that he says 
is if we are to be other centered, if we are to bring joy to one another, then it has to start with our thinking. One thinking. He says, have the same thinking. Philippian church, have the same thinking. Think alike. He actually repeats it. It's like bookends. Uh, He starts off with one thinking and he actually also ends with one thinking. Okay? Sandwiched in between, he says, have the same love. So one thinking, one love. Then he says, have the same spirit or the same soul. Okay? One thinking, one love, one soul. And then again, I think he repeats it for emphasis. He says, one thinking again. All this at the tail end of verse 2 there. How do we make each other's joy complete? How does the Philippian church make Paul's joy complete? It's by being one-minded, single-minded. In your thinking, in your love, in your connection, your soulish connection. Okay? And by the way, I believe that probably one of the reasons why Paul repeats the thinking part is that when we in our minds can begin to think about something and purpose to do something, that's when real change begins to happen. If our mindset is changed and is where God wants it to be, what's going to happen is that will act itself out in our lifestyle. Okay? If my mind is not changed, chances are really good my lifestyle is also not going to be changed. So that's verse 2. An overall, single-minded, single-focused, love, single-souled, single-mindset teaching, thinking. The next verse, verse 3, fleshes that out. And so does verse 4. And then verse 5 fleshes that out even more and gives us really something that I would say is impossible to do. But let's look at verse 3. Oops. I think I hit the wrong thing. Oh. Thank you, Cynthia. I should learn how to work this, shouldn't I? All right. So the first thing he says in verse 3 is do nothing from selfishness or conceit. Okay, how do we make each other's joy full, complete? How do the Philippians do that? By doing nothing out of selfishness or conceit. Then he says, in humility, consider one another as more important than yourself. The idea he's showing here, that he's stating here, is be humble, make yourself low, and lift others up. Literally, it's the idea of putting others above you. Okay? Now, that is not normal. That's not natural. Because we want to, even in subtle ways, we may not want other people to know this, but we like to be on top, right? We like to be the one that's up there. Okay, that, that's human nature. But Paul says, no, if you want to be a Christian that is really a part of the body of Christ and doing what he or she should, then that requires that you make yourself low and elevate other people. Okay? Don't be selfish. Don't be self-centered. Don't be self-seeking. But put others above yourselves. Michelle knows this story well, this illustration that I have. Uh, It's a very sad illustration, actually. It's funny, but it's sad. Years ago, when I started working with the Camus folks up in Richmond, uh, there was a man that I kind of knew, a, a, a Laotian man, He had made a trip over to Thailand and Laos and there was a video that I was watching. It was actually after a church service and it was just a video of his trip, a very, very long video, like hours long. And so we're talking and we're watching this video and I see him with all these young kids back in his home village in Laos. Very poor village, very, 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 very poor. And he's standing up in the middle of the kids And he's saying something. 
And so I said to Kam Sang, our, our pastor, our lay pastor, our Kamule pastor there, I said, what's he saying? I'll call him Johnny, okay? That's not his name. But what's, what's Johnny saying? I thought maybe he was having them say something in Kamu because I didn't understand what he was saying. And Kam Sang kind of gave a little bit of a sheepish smile and he said, oh, uh, he is saying, we are happy to see Johnny. So they were chanting like this, literally they were going, we are, and then the kids would go, we are happy, happy to see, to see Johnny. The kids, I guarantee, because I've, I've met some of these kids in these villages, they don't speak a word of English. They had no idea what they were saying. They were mimicking him. And what was he doing? He was exalting himself. And they were saying, hey, we're so glad you're here, Johnny. Okay, now, I don't think that any one of us in this room would even come close to doing anything like that. Okay, that's a very extreme example. I'll give you that. But in little ways, in our hearts sometimes, people don't even see it, but we do the same thing. And we are wanting to have ourselves exalted, and God's word says no. Make yourself low, exalt other people. Years ago at camp, there's a young man, this is a junior high camp, named Ryan. Very, very disrespectful junior high boy, which, uh, sir, I don't think your boys are disrespectful. I, I have not seen that. But a lot of junior high boys that I've met, that defines who they are. They just don't like authority. And this guy had been fighting some and all that kind of thing. And so I tried to talk with him. Now, he had a new creative way of getting around talking with me. Every time I'd approach him and I'd start to say something, he'd go, Buh, 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 buh. And I'd stop for a second, he'd stop. Ryan, buh, 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 buh. I could not say anything to him. I tried over several days. And I don't usually get angry. But I was upset in my heart. He didn't know it. But I was upset. It's like, how can this kid treat me, somebody in authority? I was you know, like camp dean, camp pastor. How could he possibly treat me this way? And I was offended. Okay? And then guess what happened? God got a hold of me and said, Tad, you're an idiot. What are you doing? You know, here, I don't even know if this young man knew the Lord. And here I'm expecting him to respect me. And I'm expecting him to treat me as he should. But yet, what am I doing? I'm not exalting him, I'm pushing him down and I'm getting angry and frustrated with him. So toward the end of the camp, I think it was the next to last day of, of, before the end of the camp, I saw Ryan again. I said, Ryan, and he so, uh, buh, 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 buh. I said, wait a minute. I need to ask your forgiveness. And he stopped. I said, I realize that I've been upset and angry with you in my heart. You didn't know it. And I just want to ask your forgiveness. Because I've not treated you well. You know what happened? In a heartbeat, our relationship changed. He was friendly toward me the rest of the camp. I saw him another year or two after that when he was in high school. It was a friendship. All because God got a hold of my life and said, Hey, dummy, realize what my word says. Don't exalt yourself. Put others above yourself. Don't be selfish. Don't be self-centered. That's what I was being. Okay, let's move on. That's too convicting. But as you see those things in your life, bring them to the cross and get the Lord's help and realize that God wants you to change your mindset, right? Your thinking. And then to change your actions. In verse 4, Paul says, don't look out for your own interests and things. Before we go there, though, when you first read verse 4, it really appears 
like Paul is almost softening what he says in verse 3. You know, in verse 3 he says, don't do anything out of selfishness, self-centeredness. You know, lower yourself, elevate others. And then most, every modern day translation that I've read says something like the NAS, which says, do not merely or do not only look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of other people. Anybody have a, a New American Standard Bible here this morning? I, it italicized. Notice there, Elizabeth, it's got the only italicized. Do you see that? Merely. Yeah, merely, I'm sorry. Yeah, but it's got it, it italicized. Here's what the situation is there. And, and you'll see it a number of places. And I think a lot of times the translators are correct in the way that they interpret something. But in this case, I think that they're wrong. Because what they did, the word only or merely is not in the Greek text. They added it because they felt like that was Paul's intent. I don't think so. I don't think he was softening it. If anything, I think he was strengthening his point, saying, do not look out for your own personal interests. Don't look out for your own things. Okay? Now, Janisha, you told me just recently you use the King James Version. Correct? Sometimes at least. King James... The American Standard Version of 1901, uh, a lot of the older translations, uh, Young's Little Translation, the Darby Translation, in my opinion, not that my opinion matters a whole lot, those translations get it right. Because they all say something like, look not every man on his own things. Okay, don't look at your own stuff. Don't look at what you're doing. Don't worry about that. Don't let that be your focus. But instead of the also, don't not only look out for your, don't not, do not merely look out for your own interests. If you translate it, do not look out for your own interests or your own things. The second half of that verse is, but even look out for the interests or the things of other people. Okay? Instead of the but also, I think that the little word which sometimes mean and, means and in this case or also, it can also mean even. It, it can be an intensifier. I think that's what he's doing here. Don't look out for your own things, but even look out for the things of other people. Okay? Now that's foreign to us, right? That is really, really foreign. But I think that that's what Paul is teaching. You know, don't be self-centered. Make yourself low. Make others high. Don't look out for your own stuff. Don't worry about what you need. But even look out for the interests of other people, the things of other people. Now, think with me for a moment. If we all start doing that, what will be the natural result of that. Everybody's needs are going to be met. Because if I'm focusing on other people, but then other people are focusing on me, what are we doing? We're functioning as the body of Christ as God designed. And that's beautiful. I was talking just real recently, a week or so, within the last week or so, to a lady, doesn't live in this area. She lost her job. In fact, the whole company that she worked for is shutting down. I was very pleased to hear that her focus was not, I don't know what I'm going to do for a job. You know, what am I going to do? I don't know. Her focus was not on that. Her focus was on some of her coworkers that are having money struggles right now and they're living from paycheck to paycheck. You know, what are my coworkers going to do who now don't have a job? But her biggest concern was what about the people, th this is a company like a lot of companies, that has high tech workers and also more of your blue collar worker. And she was saying, I'm really concerned about those that have little education, those that are poor and don't make as much money. 
okay? And here's what she did. She talked to her boss, the president of the company, and said, I'd like to take the month and a half severance pay that you guys are giving to each of us. I would like you to take that. I don't want any of it. I'd like you to take that and divide it among the lowest paid, least trained, least educated workers. Now, that's, to me, that is incredible. Lose a month and a half of pay to give it to the lowest people. This lady is practicing exactly what Paul is teaching, isn't she? Now, I realize, I don't think I could do that. Because I don't think we'd be able to survive a month and a half without money. And possibly none of us in this room could do that. But I think what the really, really important thing is, what's our hard attitude? And if we were in that situation where we say, oh man, I can't believe it. This just happened a few years ago and now it's happened again to me. You know, why is this happening to me? That's so easy to do. And yet, here this lady was saying, I'm okay. I'm worried about the other people. What's our hard attitude? What would we want to do? What would God want us to do if we were in that situation? Maybe we couldn't do what this lady did, but what would our heart's attitude and what would even our approach be when we approach those kinds of people that we knew were really hurting? That's what God wants to do. Don't look out for your own things, for your own interests, your own needs, but even look out for the interests and the needs of others. Now, the thing in verse 5 and following is horribly difficult. In fact, I would say it's impossible. What we already talked about is, is very, very difficult, and I would say it's impossible to do consistently. But here, this last thing in verse 5, where Paul says, Think the way that Jesus did. Think the way that Jesus did. Some of your translations may say, have this attitude. But again, it's that word think. Three times in this short passage, Paul uses the word think. Be minded this way. Twice in verse 2, like I said, you know, think the same way. Twice there. And then here in verse 5 where he says, think like Jesus thinks. And in each of those cases, each of those verbs carry with it the idea of a continuative action. Keep on doing it. So if we wanted to, we could say, keep thinking the way that Jesus thought. Like I say, that's pretty impossible to do, especially on a consistent day-by-day basis. Now, just as we wrap this up, a word of caution. If you just maybe, if you will, carelessly read, starting in verse 5, you might be able to misinterpret and say, oh, I can be like Jesus, okay? In the things that that Paul is saying here, Paul is challenging us to think like Jesus, but you and I can't be little Jesuses running around, Okay, don't try to put yourself there. You'll fail from the get-go. Listen to what Paul says, who Jesus is. He says, from eternity past through eternity future, he's God. That's the first thing. He exists in the form of God. For a time while he was on the earth, he did not seize and hold on to the glory that he always had from eternity past. He gave up much of that glory to come to this earth and to be a servant. To be a man and a servant. Okay? You and I can never do that. We don't have glory in the first place to give up. Okay? We're human beings that are born in this sinful world and we're born sinners. Okay? 
We can't be a little Jesus running around that, that does these things. And finally, Jesus, Paul says, obeyed the Father even to the point of death, even to the point of the most horrible death you could possibly try to imagine dying from, death on a cross, incredible pain and suffering for hours and hours oftentimes. Paul says, that's who Jesus is. That is our Savior. He is different from us. Totally different. Okay? And we need to honor him as our Lord. As all of you know, he is the one that today is all about, right? He is the one that needs to be the center of our lives. Our lives need to be Christ-centered. When that happens, that's when our thinking can change. That's when our actions can change. But Jesus Christ needs to be in the center for that whole process to begin happening. And I love what, he's, what, what Paul says here. He doesn't say, be a little Jesus. He says, think like Jesus does. And like he did, he gave up everything to come here. And if you remember, even in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed to God, you know, Lord, I would love for this cup, what's going to happen, this death, to pass from me. But Lord, not my will, but your will be done. Right? He obeyed God the Father so that you and I could have eternal life.